Good morning, hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of TOC, I am very happy to welcome you all to day two of Turkey Asia. Um, we have great presentations and sessions yesterday, and today we have the focus on energy transition and sustainability. We will start today with a keynote address with, from Professor Lin Lu, CEO of the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, and we will have Paul Galli, Business Development Director at AP Muller Capital as moderator. So just before we start, I would kindly ask, I'd like to ask you to please turn off your phones or put them in silent mode. Um, yeah, I can see you guys doing that, that right now. That's good. And without any further delay, I would like to invite both um, Paul and Lin to the stage. And the floor is yours. So please, uh, a round of applause for them. And thank you all. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, welcome back to a, a very busy uh, day two of uh, TOC Asia 2022. Uh, I think there were some uh, great presentations yesterday, including the keynotes by uh, Tang Chong Meng from uh, PSA International and Ken Lim of, uh, of the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. So I think uh, their keynotes, plus uh, the other discussions going on here and in the tech talk during the day, uh, there's a, certainly a buzz around decarbonisation and anything with the word green in it. And uh, hopefully today, we, in a very short period of one hour, uh, Professor uh, Lin Lu uh, and myself and your active participation will be able to uh, get a bit wiser and uh, hopefully leave the room um, pointing in the same direction and I think that's going to be a key theme of, of the next hour because are we really all aligned um, and we'll, we'll dig down into that a little deeper but let me just introduce uh, Professor Lin. Um, Professor Lin Lu is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, GCMD. It's a not-for-profit organization based here in Singapore, and it's established by six founding partners from the maritime industry and supported by the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore. GCMD's mission is to help the sector accelerate its decarbonization efforts through shaping standards, deploying solutions, financing projects, and fostering collaboration across sectors. Lynn is also the Theodora D78 and William H. Walton III 74 Professor in Engineering and Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering, currently on leave from Princeton University. Before GCMD, she was Director of the Adlinger Center for Energy and the Environment, where she commissioned the Rapid Switch Initiative and the Net Zero America study that has provided unprecedented temporal and geographic granularity on transition pathways. She also founded the Princeton E. Phillips Partnership, a flagship corporate partner program to engage industry. And she launched Princeton's first executive program in partnership with the World Economic Forum to contextualize the complexities of the energy transition for business leaders. So I think we really do have uh, a wonderful opportunity here to learn about um, the way the decarbonization is going in shipping and the port industry. And without further ado, I invite Lynn up to the uh, podium. Thank you. I'll try not to be the first of all. Well, thank you, Paul, for uh, the introduction. And Matteo, thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me? I'd rather not use the microphone if you can hear me. I'm pretty loud. Yes? Good. OK, good. Then I have my two hands. I can use my laser pointer and my um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, as Paul and Matteo had uh, introduced me, my name is Lynn Liu. I am uh, leading the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization currently. I do that by day, and in the evenings I work with my students at Princeton University, where we're making emerging uh, solar cell technologies. Um, so here I'm uh, today to talk, to talk to you about the challenges and the opportunities for maritime uh, decarbonization. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. I came into the sector about 16 months ago. And before 16 months ago, um, I hadn't really thought about shipping. Shipping, to me, was an invisible industry. You don't think about it unless your Amazon box doesn't arrive, 
or unless you read about the bottlenecks in the newspaper. But shipping is so critical to the global supply chain. Um, it transports 11 billion tons of goods, or 90% of global trade, um, overseas and over oceans. This is regulated by a single entity called the International Maritime Organization. We're here to talk about decarbonization. Shipping's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions globally is about 3%. And when you look at 3%, you say, well, it's 3%. There are much bigger sectors that contribute much more to emissions. Um, electricity, industry, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really important to think about decarbonizing shipping because shipping is such an integral part of the global supply chain. Our scope one emissions is inadvertently somebody else's scope three emissions. So if we don't decarbonize, the cargo owners, the others, can't decarbonize. So it's really important to think about shipping's emissions and how we can decarbonize. The other one is a target, and that's a 40% reduction in carbon intensity by 2030 and 50% total GHG emissions reduction by 2050. And this target um, will likely be ratcheted up during the upcoming uh, discussions at MEPC and IMO. So why is shipping so difficult to evade? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Um, the majority of you are familiar with container orders. Shipping is heterogeneous because of the 55,000 ships on the water today, there are container liners, but there are also bulk bulkers, there are tankers, there are all sorts of other carriers. These ships are of different age, different size, they go on different routes. Some are on fixed routes, some are on planned services. Very, very heterogeneous sector. A very heterogeneous sector requires a very heterogeneous portfolio of solutions. There is no one size fit all, different strokes for different folks. Right? So this is one of the reasons why shipping, decarbonizing shipping is, is, is challenging. Another reason is the ecosystem for decarbonization is actually not mature. We can do the improving energy efficiency, we can improve fuel consumption. We can deploy biofuels, we can deploy some low carbon fuels, but they will not get us to net zero. The alternative fuels that we need to get to net zero, to the green fuels that we will talk about in a little bit, they're not available at cost or at scale. And if you look at these various projections, including MEN Engine's uh, recent report, they project that even by 2050, uh, more than 30% of two-stroke engines are still going to be burning fossil fuels. Oil and gas is sticky because it's such a good fuel. It's so energy dense. So moving away from that is challenging. And just to put this in perspective, we can look at some of these numbers. So the Global Maritime Forum had come up with a report that says if we're going to be Par uh, Paris aligned, we need, for our fuels and shipping, 5% of that needs to be zero carbon by 2030. And you can look at that number and say, OK, 5%. Not a big deal, right? Well, 5% translates to about 60 million tons of fossil fuel. Green fuels are less energy dense than fossil fuels. In the case of methanol and ammonia, they're about two and a half times less energy dense. That means we need about 40, ton, 40 million tons of, let's say, green ammonia. Today, we have no green ammonia, we have gray ammonia. Gray ammonia is being produced at about 200 million tons a year, but only 20 million tons is being shipped around. So 20 million tons of gray ammonia being shipped around. We need 40 million tons to satisfy this 5% number. Another way to look at this is the recent IRENA report that just came out. They went around and they counted up the number of green ammonia projects. And so these are currently under development, right? So no green ammonia yet. But they counted up all these green ammonia projects and they projected forward by 2030, there will be 15 million tons of green ammonia. We need 40 million tons to satisfy the 5%. This is how big the challenge is. And I'm not saying this to be despondent, and it's not meant to be depressing, but it's really important that we understand how big the challenge is, because it's only by understanding how big the challenge is can we figure out what role we play, how we can solve this problem. 
And this brings me to GCMD. This is GCMD's mission. Our mission is to help the maritime sector eliminate GHG emissions. And we do this with the context that I've just told you, by helping shape future fuel standards, by piloting and trialing low carbon solutions, but we do this at commercial or operational conditions. Okay, it's really important to do that in, under commercial operational conditions because that's the only way these solutions can scale. We do this by financing first of a kind pilots or projects. And then it's really important to think about collaboration both within the sector as well as across sectors in order to decarbonize. So this is how we were formed. Uh, Paul had mentioned that we had six founding partners plus MPA. They came together and they decided that an organization needs to be formed that's very action oriented. So they came together and pledged their support, both financially um, and sort of structurally and from an infrastructure perspective, uh, before we were identified. And so those uh, seven partners include BHP, BW Group, the Foundation of DNB, Eastern Pacific Shipping, MPA, ONE, and SEM Corporation. We've subsequently brought on lots of other players. It's really important to have this diverse ecosystem because decarbonization needs to happen across that supply chain. Just last week, we announced our partnership with GAR. This is the largest uh, insurer for the sector. And it's really important to have them involved because we have these pilots. They can help insure and underwrite our pilots. But they can also learn from us in supporting the first movers of their customers who are going to be deploying these future fuels. This is our perspective on the energy transition. We're looking at the energy transition over three decades. We just said that green fuels aren't available today at scale or at cost. So to get to net zero, we need the green fuels. So that's in the longer term. But that does not mean we should sit around and do nothing. We need to start bending the emissions curve now. And so that means we need to think about near-term solutions, things and measures and technical um, uh, uh, technologies that can help us improve fuel efficiency, uh, reduce energy consumption. Those are important, and we should deploy them now. We should think about biofuels. We should think about liquefied natural gas, provided that we can uh, eliminate slip and leaks uh, upstream, they can cut emissions by about 20%. So all these solutions we need to think about and start to deploy now. And then in the medium term, we believe that carbon capture is important because it provides a runway for future fuels to scale. So this is our roadmap uh, that we put together when we first started. The different circles represent the different pilots that we would like to launch or the different studies that we would like to launch. The solid ones means they've been launched, so they're currently underway. And the half or a quarter filled ones means we're scoping them currently. And you'll see that they map exactly to that curve that I showed you earlier on. On the near term side of things, we're looking at developing an assurance framework for drop in green fuels. Of the drop in green fuels, only biofuels is available today. So the pilot that's going on works with biofuels. And I'll tell you a little more about this pilot. Just last month, we launched a shipboard carbon capture pilot. It's an end-to-end -end pilot. It looks at capturing on board, storage on board, offloading from the ship to uh, shore, and then what do you do with that CO2 once you've offloaded? The last thing you want is to demonstrate that you can capture, and then you release it back into the atmosphere. That's the worst thing you can do. Um, and then finally, ammonia buffering. So this is the first pilot that we actually started well, when we started, when we were founded last year. Um, we uh, wanted to do an ammonia bunkering pilot and then quickly realized that we couldn't do one because the safety guidelines aren't available to do an ammonia bunkering pilot. So we actually took one step back and did a study to develop the guidelines, the safety guidelines, the operational guidelines. And so the study is on track. It's uh, going to be finished in a couple of weeks, so we're very excited about it. And then we would be able to share that publicly um, uh, so that we can move forward and use that as a basis for our pilot. So let me start with the biofuels assurance framework. The whole idea is as follows. We surveyed 
150 to 200 stakeholders in scoping this pilot. And we asked, why aren't you using biofuels? And of course, cost is one of the biggest factors. But the thing that commonly people said was that the, the, the supply chain is very opaque. The biofuels, as it comes from the producers down the supply chain, um, it changes hands many, many times. And by the time it gets to the fuel purchaser, you may or may not have confidence what you're getting or how much you're getting. And so we thought it would be important to do a pilot to set up an assurance framework so that you can provide assurance on the quantity, on the quality, and on the abatement potential of the biofuels that's involved. Um, so this really focused on the supply chain because there are plenty of biofuels pilots that have been done that demonstrate that you can burn biofuels on board ships. So that's not the goal of this pilot. It's really to focus on the supply chain. And of course, once the biofuel is bunkered on the ship, you set sail and you burn that biofuel and then you can track the carbon emissions. And so the idea is to do route-based uh, pilots uh, with, this, uh, with this study. Um, with this uh, pilot, we have uh, 13 vessels bunkering at three different ports on three different continents. We are testing various different biofuels, including FANE, including HBO, this crude algae oil is something new. Um, it's something that's not even produced at scale yet, so we're not very confident that we can get enough of this for the pilot, but nonetheless, we thought it was important to try because crude algae oil, or at least algae, when the way it's grown, um, it has significantly lower carbon footprint. So the idea is you can use less of it to achieve the same abatement, or you can use the same amount and achieve even more of it. Okay, so it's a Gen 3 biofuel. And you can see the different routes that uh, we're looking at um, and the bunk rate um, uh, ports. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to say that you know, dosing of our first batch happened. And in fact, uh, the biofuel blend is in Singapore and the first bunk rate exercise has happened. But you can imagine, because we're doing pilots and we're worried about all these different operations, scheduling all the vessels and trying to make sure that the biofuels dose at the appropriate time and that the biofuel actually comes to the appropriate port and gets distributed properly, it's, it's not trivial. And I mean, when I say that we're in the trenches, we're really in the trenches. Um, and so these are our partners on this biofuel pilot. Um, these are the fuel purchasers, so they are the ones that have the vessels sailing across these different ports and bumping at these different ports. BCG is helping us with analytics, bumper trace, is uh, the tracer technology provided. So we're putting a tracer up at uh, upstream where the fuel is being produced. This tracer allows us to identify the biofuel, its origin, and it allows us to quantify how much biofuel when you mix it with heavy fuel oil. Um, so that's the technology we're using. So bunker traces are partner there. And then, um, you know, man engines involved, and these others are lab service providers to provide testing along different points of the supply chain. And so you might ask, well, what's the impact of this pilot? Um, so that's sort of quantified here. The partners cumulatively own or operate 2,500 vessels. And so uh, the tonnage uh, is shown here. Um, and so testing labs have global reach, and the engine makers um, have 75% of the market share of two stroke engines. This is the shipboard carbon capture pilot that we uh, just launched last month. Um, again, the goal is to do an end-to-end -end pilot to demonstrate that we can capture and we can store on board. And that's, by the way, a big challenge uh, on ships because every ton of fuel you burn, you generate three tons of carbon dioxide. So you need to figure out where you're going to put the carbon dioxide. And then you need to demonstrate that you can offload it. That has not been demonstrated before. And then we need to identify an off-taker. And so one of our partners have stepped up and said, we'll take your carbon dioxide. It will be a feedstock for us to produce chemicals subsequently. Um, what are the other challenges? Well, to use a scrubber to absorb carbon dioxide, that's very energy intensive. And so the last thing we wanted to do to put a scrubber on ships and then burn more fuel so that we can capture carbon dioxide. Right? So, um, so the energy demand and energy supply is something that we needed to look at very, very carefully. And then to make sure that there is space on board ships for these carbon dioxide tanks so you can store the carbon dioxide. 
So introducing Project Remarkable. So this is going to be the first end-to-end uh, -end demonstration of shipboard carbon capture at scale. Um, we've identified a ship, so this is Stena's Imperial or its sister ship. Both are MR tankers. We decided to do this on an MR tanker because comparable size ships contribute 17% of shipping's emissions, so we think it's a big segment that we're addressing. Um, I've been on board this ship. Um, I went on board when it was here refueling um, at Anchorage, so it was exciting to see it, um, to kind of get a sense of where the carbon dioxide tanks need to go, how big the scrubber needs to be, et cetera. We're targeting 30% capture, and this 30% is from this energy balance that I was telling you about. Right? We don't want to burn too much more fuel to capture carbon dioxide. That's equivalent to a capture rate of 1,000 kilograms per hour of CO2. We'd like to do a 500-hour operation that includes a 10-day journey between two ports and then eventually do the offloading. And then really, the goal is to do, uh, to demonstrate a cost-down pathway uh, to about 150 euros a ton. So this is super ambitious, and it's a very risky project. But we think, you know, GCMD is positioned to do this. Um, if we fail, we'll know where the bottlenecks are. But if we're successful, it demonstrates that you can do this from end to end for a significant uh, segment uh, of the shipping sector. Again, partners are involved. OGCI, I would consider, is out of sector. So this is the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. Um, it's basically an organization where the big 10 oil and gas companies are involved with. Um, Alpha Laval is uh, for, uh, providing the scrubber, the heat exchanger. TNO is an engineering consulting firm, and then Delta Marine is the naval uh, architect. Let's talk about ammonia bunkering. So I mentioned that this, is one of, this was one of the first things we wanted to do, um, because we looked across the ammonia supply chain and we decided that there are gaps. And we asked ourselves, how can we plug in these gaps? Fuels being produced, or they're working on producing these fuel, uh, fuels, um, the ships being built is not available until 2025, 2026 time frame. In the mean meantime, what can we do? We decided it was important to figure out how to safely move the molecules around, i.e. bunkering, so that when the fuels are ready, and when the ship is ready, we're all ready to go. Okay, so this was the gap we had. Um, and we couldn't do a bunkering exercise because the guidelines weren't available to generate the regulatory sandbox for the exercise. So that's how the study came about. Um, I'm happy to say that the study's on track. There are no showstoppers. We've done the demand projection. We've identified two sites in Singapore where we can do this bumpering exercise. Hazard Hazoff studies have been done on these two sites. QRA's been done. Um, and so all this is coming together um, so that we can do a public sharing at the beginning of the year. And just to, um, again, emphasize the ecosystem, we had 22 industry study partners across the supply chain, and this was really important because we want to mine the experience and the expertise from those who have been transporting ammonia as a part of There's also Yara, which is the ammonia fuel producer that's been involved, that's providing input and feedback to this study. Um, and then, of course, terminal operators, uh, barge operators, port and terminal operators, et cetera, et cetera. It's all across the supply chain. In parallel, there was a regulatory working group that's been put together uh, by MPA. And so this includes, you know, um, the civil defense folks, the water guys, the air pollution guys, et cetera, et cetera. Six or seven regulatory authorities involved. Um, it's important to have this conversation in parallel so we can address their concerns. Um, because if you don't, and you finish the study and you submit it for approval, they might say, well, you haven't addressed A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z, and then you're back to the drawing board. The idea of having these kinds of parallel conversation is to really shrink down the timeline so we can get this done in a short amount of time. So this is the eight months that we're talking about. Right? Just for reference, LNG technical references took years to develop, and we don't want to do that. So let me move on and talk a little bit about how we're thinking um, as we move forward. So all that I've talked to you about has been focused on really shipping itself on the sea side of things. But increasingly, we're realizing that it's really important to think about the land side as well. Without land side infrastructure, we can't decarbonize shipping. And so you've heard of these green corridors. I've shown you here the green corridor that was announced 
uh, this year between Port of Singapore and Port of Rotterdam. Uh, this is the longest uh, green and digital corridor is what MPA calls it. But there's no green corridor without green infrastructure. Right? Green corridor means these ships are using green fuels. But the green fuels need to come from the land side. And so this green corridor framework needs to be anchored by ports and infrastructure that are green. And so it's really important for us to begin to think about the land side infrastructure. Um, the International Chamber of Shipping um, is developing these clean energy marine hubs. So getting governments to talk to industry to set up these hubs so that you can accelerate the production of fuels. And I mean, green hydrogen has a myriad of other applications too. So you can use these hubs basically to anchor industries, to anchor the shipping sector, etc. So increasingly, this conversation is moving to the land side. And the Clean Energy Marine Hub um, has uh, five countries signed up, and there are more countries that are wanting to sign up uh, to this as well. So I thought I would just give you an example of this. I was really inspired by this example. Um, this was when I was at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh a couple of weeks ago. I met Jose Fermo, who is the CEO of Porto do Asu. This is a port, a private port in Brazil. It's a really sort of a holistic way of thinking about the function of a port. So this is the only private port in Brazil. It started in 2018. But it's got a whole lot of land. So it can think about, besides just getting ships to come in and bunker and take cargo, etc. They have renewable energy projects, solar and wind, that then feed into uh, hydrogen production. And this hydrogen production then can uh, be used to produce ammonia. And the idea is, well, this ammonia can be used for, as a marine fuel for shipping. But they're hedged because then they can think about using the ammonia to produce fertilizer for domestic use. Because domestic uh, fertilizer use has been largely important. Additionally, the hydrogen that's produced, in addition to feeding it to make green ammonia, they can use that hydrogen to reduce iron ore. So Brazil is the second largest iron ore exporter, apparently. Um, instead of exporting iron ore, you can export pig iron, which is sort of the next process up, and you can use that hydrogen to take the iron ore into pig iron. That increases the price of the commodity. So it's this holistic way of thinking about how we can bring industries together at the port side to also support uh, decarbonization of shipping. So I'll end uh, by summarizing and providing uh, you with our outlook. I mean, I think, um, I think I've said this enough. And near midterm solutions are really important because they help close that Oh, oh yeah. it's here, never mind. So they help close the gap. Um, in the run-up to green fuels. We need to think about land-side infrastructure and port-side infrastructure because the build-out is so important to support decarbonization of shipping. Um, I think the number that's been thrown around is about $3 trillion to decarbonize shipping. 80% of that needs to be spent on land. Okay. So increasingly, this land-side conversation needs to happen. And then shipping plays a critical role in accelerating the energy transition. What do I mean by that? When you produce all this ammonia and all this methanol, and it needs to be transported around, I think shipping plays an important role. So we should increasingly be thinking about how we can play a role in accelerating the energy transition. When we talk about carbon capture, the sources and the sinks don't necessarily align, and you need to get the capture of carbon dioxide from the source to the sink. Can shipping play a role? What kind of role would that be? So I think uh, decarbonizing, decarbonizing shipping need not just be sort of a burden. I think there are opportunities that we should think about because it's going to change the landscape tremendously. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn. That was uh, very inspiring and educational. Uh, I guess from a professor, that's what we kind of expected, but uh, I hope we now perform as good students. So uh, you need to, uh, you know, to present your essay uh, later in the day, uh, and the professor will mark it. So I hope you took some uh, diligent notes there. Um, let me try and sort of recap a few of the things without uh, repeating um, this excellent presentation. And just to get you 
thinking about potential questions. I think it's really important that we, we understand what you're all thinking, what the industry really wants to get out of this session today and, uh, and move the conversation forward. We're not going to answer it in the, you know, the hour we've had in this particular session uh, and even the rest of the day or the week or the month. But I think it's great that the uh, initiatives such as the, the Global uh, Center for Maritime Decarbonization has taken this step forward and other uh, centers of excellence around the world. So at least we, you know, we know there's, a, there's an issue out there and, and there's many learned people working on it. Um, technical solutions. Uh, technical solutions are clearly the, uh, the forefront here and, and, and it's all about chemistry uh, and it's all about uh, trying to get the most energy efficient green solution because otherwise we'd still use coal, wouldn't we? I mean, it's, uh, it's got a lot of energy packed into that coal and we'd be having steamships and uh, ideally uh, we'd be moving on uh, into these green fuels but as, uh, as Lynn explained, it's a timing thing. We can't do it tomorrow, so how should we uh, best prepare ourselves uh, on different tracks? And I think there was a slide that was shown that showed different uh, work streams and transition fuels. We've got until uh, 11 o'clock, uh, so we've got about, what, 20, 25 minutes. Um, and I think uh, some of the key things, just to sort of stimulate your brains on, on, on potential questioning, uh, infrastructure, uh, the cost, this $3 trillion that it's going to take. Um, and one thing that was uh, very uh, eloquently put forward was that a lot of this investment is actually on land. Of course, typically in the, in the bunker business, um, and even going you know, previous to the LSFO days, you only really had to handle, your port only had to be prepared for HFO, let's say, and a little bit of uh, lighter diesel. But HFO, so you only needed the tanks for diesel, the bunker barges, the bunker ships for one, one type of product. And now, of course, you need it for all these different types of fuel, potentially, whether it's LNG, ammonia, methanol, etc. And this is where this three trillion comes from. And you're going to need space. You're going to need space because now you don't have one tank. And as Lynn uh, also explained very well, these different fuels have different energy um, energy components to them, so they're not as efficient as perhaps, you know, HFO and, uh, and some of the traditional fuels that we've been using. Um, I like the point about Guard being a member of the GCMD, uh, and I'd, I'd like to expand on that perhaps a little bit later on, on the role of perhaps insurance and, uh, and the risk around uh, some of these uh, initiatives. And then the ports. We've talked a lot about ships and bunkering and, and some great stuff there. Um, but look, in the terminal world, what do we handle? We handle the ships when they come in. We're that interface between land and sea. So what is the role of the port and the terminal in order to, uh, in order to be a key part uh, and solution provider uh, in, in enabling the, the whole greening of the, of the supply chain? And even yesterday, uh, Ken Lim from MPA and Tan Chong Meng from uh, PSA they also incorporated into their discussion and, and presentation the fact that the shipping is part of it. It's a massive part of it, okay? I mean, yeah, on a, on a two-week voyage from, uh, from Shanghai to LA or something like that, then the ship's going to burn a lot of fuel. Bigger ship, bigger fuel, going to mean uh, bigger fuel tanks because the fuel is less energy efficient, although it's greener, etc., etc. But it's only part of the supply chain, so we need the whole supply chain from the factory to the supermarket, to your house, in fact, has to be green to make full advantage. So, uh, that's enough of me. Uh, let's have some of you. Um, so, we've got Matteo there standing at the back, uh, ready with a microphone. If I could ask you to uh, state your name and the organization that you represent, and uh, please keep your question as brief as possible. Thank you. Any takers? Yes, please, Jerome. Okay, so I don't have to mention my name anymore. Uh, Jerome from uh, Waves Group. Uh, I'll keep the question brief, but it's more than one. Um, firstly, um, you seem to concentrate on the use of ammonia as an alternative fuel. Um, so why not look at LNG as an intermediate solution or direct burn of, uh, of, of uh, hydrogen? That's first question. Second question, um, carbon capture. Um, I, I couldn't immediately find back what it was, but 
there are international rules against the export and import of wastes. Um, and funnily enough, captured carbon in some districts is considered a waste product now and therefore cannot be imported or exported. So how are you going to deal with that uh, when you capture it? Thank you. Thanks for those questions. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. Um, so one was fuel. I would say that GCMD is fuel agnostic. We would be happy to look at any fuel um, that have, I think our mandate is to look at gaps, right? How we can help accelerate the decarbonization process. So we're looking for gaps that we can fill in. So LNG is already commercially available. So the technical gaps there are probably not significant. Um, and then I can come back and talk about hydrogen. I mean, the other one that's on the table is methanol. And I would say methanol also has a supply chain. Um, we decided to look at ammonia first, also because of a production, um, from a pr production perspective. So um, both green methanol and green ammonia have to come from green hydrogen, which comes from renewable electrons. And right now, renewable electrons is the bottleneck, so generating green hydrogen is a bottleneck. For every three equivalents of green hydrogen, you produce two equivalents of green ammonia. You produce one equivalent of green methanol. And the energy density between methanol and ammonia is only 20% difference. So if you're interested in making as much as you can, then ammonia is, has a slight edge relative to methanol. So those are a myriad of reasons why we chose ammonia. Hydrogen is a completely different story, right? Um, ammonia's boiling temperature is negative 33 degrees. Hydrogen's boiling temperature is negative 253 degrees. So the cryogenic requirements for hydrogen is just really, really intense. And I think I've seen multiple reports now, and the number is always about a third. So you need to spend a third of the energy that you're carrying to cool hydrogen and keep it liquefied. And then there's the boil off, right? The boil off is essentially about 1% a day. So if it's a 10 day journey, it's 10% boil off. So we think transporting hydrogen is just really, really challenging. If you can make hydrogen and use hydrogen on site, by all means do that. But if you're gonna transport an energy vector, right now with what we have, hydrogen's just a lot more challenging than ammonia. So that's why we honed in on ammonia. And then we sort of looked across the supply chain and we said, okay, there's an obvious gap. Safety is a gap because ammonia is toxic. We know how to transport ammonia as a cargo, but the loading and unloading of ammonia as a cargo is different from if you were to use it as a bunkering fuel. The transfer frequency is different. The volumes are different. Where you would do the transfer is very different, right? I mean, we don't see ammonia cargo being transferred in Singapore, but you see bunkering exercises all the time in the ports. So um, the proximity to population, um, so the safety requirements is so much more stringent. This is also why we've decided to do the pilot in Singapore. We can do the pilot anywhere. We've decided it's important to do the safety guidelines and look at doing a pilot in Singapore, figuring that if we can do, well, I shouldn't say if, when we can do one safely in Singapore, chances are you can do one safely elsewhere because of the stringent safety requirements here in Singapore, because of the proximity to population densities. Um, what was the second question? Second question. Oh, carbon capture. Yes. What, what about carbon capture now? Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, transboundary, uh, transboundary issues. Yes, so I mean, with London Protocol and all that, carbon dioxide is a waste, so this is a huge problem. Um, but there are sufficient, so I guess the question is whether you believe carbon, uh, carbon capture should be, a port, should be part of the portfolio of solution. If the answer is yes, then um, bottlenecks abound. You mentioned regulatory bottlenecks, but there are also lots of technical bottlenecks. We think that the regulatory bo bottlenecks need to be sorted out eventually um, because landside carbon capture is important and is going to play a big role. And so as long as landside carbon capture is gonna play a big role, um, the sources and sinks don't match up. You have to transport captured carbon dioxide anyway. So we believe that the regulatory component needs to be sorted out. Now, we don't have the expertise, nor are we sort of in that world. Certainly what we think we can do is to 
is to figure out the ship side carbon capture, the technical bottlenecks, to iron those out. And if the data and the findings in ironing those out can help feed you know, the policy discussion, the regulatory discussion, we're happy to share that data. We are aware of the, the, the issues, um, but at the same time, we, we're optimistic and hopeful that those have to be sorted out. I mean, and you can look at the Northern Lights project, right? I mean, so it, uh, carbon dioxide is being transported uh, between the Netherlands and Norway. So it's a commercial contract, bilateral commercial contract that's backed by their respective governments. Um, so I think things like this need to start happening on a small scale, and then you need an international framework that kind of guides generally, globally, what happens with captured carbon dioxide. Another example would be, isn't it, uh, what is it, Belgium to the UK, right? Um, that was another example. So there are a couple of these examples, short distances, small volumes, but I think, nonetheless, those could be models that we could look at. Um, and then as, as these examples start to accumulate, I think the international framework can come in. Thank you very much, Jerome, for your question. I, I, I mean, it's interesting, right? The green corridors, as you mentioned, and the northern lights. Um, you also uh, touched on the fact that you know, a lot of the initiatives can be better applied to liner shipping, but there are still a lot of other ships out there which are not on regular routes, such as bulk carriers and, and tankers themselves, to a large extent, tramp around the world. Some short sea shipping, such as ferry routes, uh, lend themselves very, very well to, to some of these new initiatives. And I just wonder, you know, if this is going to influence trade lanes in the future, because if we look at the, the long history of shipping and, and our maritime human interaction, then we started with, with manual power and we could go as far as we could row or something like that. Then we discovered, oh, we can put a sail up and the wind can blow us along. And, and trade routes around the world uh, were formed because of the wind patterns and, and the trade winds and these type of things. Then we discovered um, steam power and, and the, the bunkering ports. And the word bunker, remember, comes from the fact that uh, the bunker was where you stowed the coal on the ship. So that is the bunker. And the coal ports of the world, uh, including Singapore, which had a large coal stock in, in the days of steamships, and some of the other places like Cape Town and uh, the typical sort of geographical nodes of the world became ports in their own right because they were the coaling ports, coaling ports. And that moved on into the, into the fossil fuel, into the HFO world. But the thing is, a lot of that oil, it's interesting where the bunker fuel comes from uh, or where it's made has become, those ports have become the world's trade ports, such as Singapore, Rotterdam, Houston. The fuel, the raw feedstock for it comes from the Middle East and some other places in the world. How do you see, for example, the green electron? Where's the source of the green electron? Because if you need a lot of wind and solar, this could be in the remote part of the Sahara Desert or, or in a place a long way from, from Singapore. Well, uh, that's a really good question. And I mean, I don't have the crystal ball, but I, I mean, I, I'll just kind of play along and kind of talk, talk, talk through how we're thinking about this. I mean, um, no question, I think, uh, countries and nations that have uh, an abundance of natural resources have an advantage here, right? I mean, I think because you want to generate uh, the electrons, use it on site to generate the hydrogen, and we just talked about how challenging it is to transport hydrogen so you generate the fuels there. And so then the question is, can you transport those fuels around? And I think, I mean, um, it, it remains to be seen. Uh, so uh, there's no question there's going to be a lot of transport of, you know, ammonia. what was it, the predictions, like by 2030, it goes up by 100. Uh, so right now, we produce about 200 million uh, tons. By 2030, it's going to be 300 million tons. And so a lot of this is going to have to move around. And, and again, I think this is why shipping has, uh, this, we should look at this as an opportunity. On the flip side of the coin, um, I think business will change uh, simply because of the energy density of the fuel. So currently, I learned this and I was surprised by this because I mean my picture of shipping is, is still relatively simplistic, right? I thought, oh, you know, as you go along the way, you bunker along the way. But it turns out that more than 50% of the ships only bunker at one port. So it doesn't matter where you go, tramp or fix, more than 50% of the ships on water only bunker at one port. So it speaks to this hub and spoke model, right? I have my favorite port that I go to to do my bunkering. Well, if your next fuel that you use is two and a half times less energy dense, 
if you want to continue doing that, you need a much, much bigger fuel tank. That means you're going to have to sacrifice cargo space. Or if I don't want to sacrifice cargo space, that means I'm going to have to stop more frequently for fuels. Um, so I, I think that's going to change the business model and the operational model of shipping uh, simply because of the energy density. Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree. And um, on, on some of the key trade lanes like Asia Europe, then, then that might be the case. And, and Singapore would still be a, a, one of those key centers, but then perhaps somewhere along the North African coast or you could see that because they have the wind and the sun. So. Yeah, I mean, that said, I think, so um, I forgot to mention the competency, competency framework piece. I think, you know, ammonia, we talked about how, how ammonia is toxic. And so, I mean, is ammonia going to be available at every single port? I don't know, probably not, right? I mean, um, I think, so, so that's why also this idea that shipping is going to be, shipping is very heterogeneous and the, the solutions are going to be heterogeneous because, I mean, I do believe, you know, like man engines uh, projections that you're still going to have engines that are going to burn fossil fuel well into 2050s because, simply because, I mean, it's an easy fuel to kind of spread around. It's energy dense, right? Smaller ports can handle it. So one can argue that you can do biofuels that way. You still need to get the biofuels there if they don't have biofuels. But yeah, okay, one can, one can argue that. But nonetheless, I think, um, it, I, I don't know how practical it is to think about having ammonia at every single port. That's why I think the future is going to be a multi-fuel future. Um, and that's why we need a portfolio of heter a heterogeneous portfolio of solutions. Thank you. Let's, um, let's turn it back to the floor. Any, uh, any thoughts, any questions? Anybody? Whilst you're, um, whilst you're waiting for your uh, bright idea, uh, we've got about eight minutes left. Um, can we talk a little bit, uh, Lynn, about ports? We've talked a lot about the ships and, and, and the fuel to make them move. Um, but, you know, in our audience, we've got terminal operators and, uh, and people such as myself in AP Muller Capital who invest in infrastructure in ports. How can we uh, make a better job and how can we, as the shipping evolves into a greener world, how, how can the port industry, um, you know, play its part as well? Should we electrify everything tomorrow? Even if I do that in Indonesia, the power of the electron is coming from a coal-fired power station. Does that really help? Should I carry on putting HFO in my, in my reach stacker in the container yard because that's more efficient? Um, Many questions. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a firm believer that you need to move everything in parallel. It's like playing a jigsaw puzzle. You never, well, I don't know, maybe you do start playing with one single point piece and then you just kind of grow from there. But the way I play with the jigsaw puzzle is, you know, you assemble sort of groups of pieces and you try and see how you can bring those groups together, right? And so I think electrification is a no-brainer. Yes, the electricity could be brown, but I'm sure somebody upstream is working to, to is greenify a word, greenify the electrons, right? I mean, I think um, you can say the same thing about Singapore, right? I mean, the elect electricity is still brown. Um, but they're working hard, right? And so I, I don't think we can wait is the point. It's just like, you know, I, I look at banks and financial institutions, um, and if you're going to wait for an offtake agreement before you would fund and invest in a fuel producer, then I think it's, I mean, because all these things take time. It takes time to get a permit. It takes time to build up the infrastructure. So by the time you're, you have a sort of a final investment decision to the time you actually get the first drop of fuel mm -hmm. is many years, right? So I think we just need to get going. So there are a number of things you can do on the port side to support that, I would say. And then I had another train of thought that I now no longer remember. But when I, when I do, I'll come back to it. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, we'll uh, be discussing this for, for many months and years ahead in, in conferences such as TOC. And, and, you know, I think the port industry is already taking a good stride uh, in electrification of cranes and, uh, and other uh, cargo handling equipment. Oh, Lynn, please, enlighten us. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just, I think, uh, again, because infrastructure takes time to build out. So, I mean, these green fuels don't yet have infrastructure, right, um, and supply chains. So, I mean, if we're thinking about storage terminals, bunkering facilities, those all take time to build out too. And so, I mean, I think, again, I, this is why I'm, 
um, so excited about the safety study that we've done because it partly addresses that because it uh, addresses how you do the bunkering and so it can uh, that information can inform what potentially storage facilities would look like etc cetera, etc cetera. I mean is this an opportunity to now think about building out and what does building out that storage um, facility look like? What does building out a bunkering facility look like, right? I mean, because again, it's going to take years before that becomes available, even from the day you decide you're going to build it out. But that's, that's, the, that's getting to the point on, on the risk. And, you know, the, uh, you've, you have Guard as a, as a key member of GCMD. And, and perhaps that's where the insurance industry is interested now, and they're playing their part. Because if somebody came along and they just built an ammonia bunking facility, and then they, uh, you know, they, they want to add it to their policy, and the, the insurers don't know anything about ammonia, let's say they didn't, then uh, they, they might not just insure you because they say, well, this is just too risky. So this is a, a combination, as you say, the sandbox of putting everybody in there, the regulators, the, t the technical, the engineers, uh, and, and the people who, who can help mitigate the risk. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I told uh, the folks at Guard that, you know, essentially what they're doing is doing a pilot on our pilot. Because, I mean, yes, they're providing insurance and they're underwriting our projects, but they're also trying to figure out their risk assessment framework. Um, and so it's, it's using us as an experiment for them to figure out their risk assessment framework too. So, so it's really a pilot on top of a pilot, right? And so, uh, so I think that's why. Um, uh, the partnership makes sense. Um, we like the people a lot, and we're hopeful that this partnership will be very fruitful. Great. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, if there is a question from the audience, then uh, please. Yeah, please, uh, Jay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Lu, for excellent presentation. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, one, besides the constraints that you mentioned, uh, or maybe just focusing on the constraints that you mentioned, particularly, let's say, production constraints, uh, and that we see across all green fuels, be it methanol, be it biofuel, or ammonia, etc. And if we were to all combine together, considering today about 350 million tons of bunkering, you are probably talking about a billion ton or more of all the fuels put together very, very ballpark estimate. So what it seems to me, this is probably one of the largest constraints in decarbonization drive. Uh, that makes me think that when I look at uh, the, the constituent of GCMD, I don't see, uh, say, a producer uh, in that partnership. So I'm wondering if that's a deliberate omission or it is that there's inhibition from the producers to be taking a lead because there may not be enough demand for it. So, so what is the issue there? That's number one. And uh, number two, in terms of the engines, I understand that we are still <clears throat> a bit far away from ammonia-fired engines, as uh, this isn't there. Even in Japan, probably, they're firing probably 30 40%, maybe not more. And for ships, uh, probably we are even further away. So, so do you know the latest in terms of where are we? Right, so um, producers are part of our ecosystem. So Yara is a study partner on the ammonia study, which is really, really important, right? Um, so, so they are part of that ecosystem. I think, you know, the, the partnership model is, uh, so I mean, at the top tier, it may not be for everybody. It depends on their business model too. But we are certainly talking to, uh, to fuel producers. It's really important to talk, about, to talk to the fuel producers. Now, are we gonna work directly with them? Uh, that's unlikely because that is so far up the supply chain, but it's important for us to keep track of what is going on. So it turns out, I mean, at COP27, met with a bunch of green ammonia, uh, I mean, ammonia producers trying to make green ammonia, as well as methanol producers. In fact, green methanol is available um, in significant, well, I guess significant is relative, but in, in much bigger quantities than gray uh, green, green ammonia. Um, it turns out that uh, with green methanol, so first let me back up. The way green methanol is made by at least this producer is they take biogas, okay? And biogas is carbon rich, so then they, they uh, dose in renewable hydrogen to make the green methanol. Now this green methanol, um, because of the land transport subsidies in the US, they can sell it for a really high margin. And so they came to shipping 
And they talk to folks like Maersk and others and say, do you want this methanol? But this is the price point. And we can't afford the price point, or we don't want to pay for the price point, right? So I mean, I think there is a production question. There's also a cost question, right? So, so I think that picture needs to be complete in that sense. But that said, I think we, we are certainly talking to them because it's really important to keep track of where, where, where the bottlenecks are and how if, 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 if there is anything we can do to kind of accelerate that. Um, one thing we're thinking about um, uh, pretty heavily and we're having conversations is with the power sector because if the power sector uses ammonia, the quantity they use is significantly more than the marine fuel quantity, at least you know, in, the context, in the local and regional context. So if there's an opportunity to aggregate demand across sectors, then you can crowd in green ammonia faster. Right? Um, so these are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about. How do you crowd in stuff faster? Um, what was the other question? Sorry. Oh, engines. So um, the last time um, I was in Copenhagen, so this was April. Uh, April. Um, so I went and visited Man Engine and saw saw uh, the prototype um, and. At that point, they said that the engine development, the ammonia engine development, is on track to be done in 2024-ish, and then the first ship would be available after that. I mean, there are rumors, um, I'm sure around the room you've heard as well, that that could be potentially delayed because the testing is delayed. Um, so I have not um, seen an update since then, but I think that's sort of the time frame, 2024, 2025, 2026-ish, 2026 right? Um, um, is, is, is sort of what's, um, what's sort of being tossed around. The smaller four-stroke engines, I think, may be available a little sooner than that, but probably not too much. Um, so that's why I think these different pieces need to be together, need to be ironed out so that you can kind of think about the next phase. Um, in fact, the study guideline that we're doing, um, what we're doing right now is we're scoping and we're talking to stakeholders uh, to see how we can put together a pilot. I mean, the initial thought is we want to do uh, pilots of different configuration. We want to do a transfer of ammonia. And here, whether it's green or gray is less important because the point is to demonstrate that you can transfer ammonia safely. So we want to do at least two configurations, one at low flow rates. And the low flow rate one is to get the operators and the seafarers comfortable with the idea of bunkering ammonia. Um, and then we want to do one at high flow rates, and we're going to have to use proxy assets for both these, so maybe an ammonia carrier in that case. But you do one at high flow rates that mimic the operational conditions or the commercial conditions that you would transfer ammonia bunker at. Um, so we're talking and we're trying to kind of, you know, scope out the ecosystem and see who's interested in participating and whether there's alignment. So if, you know, there is interest in the room, Please find us, come talk to us. Um, we'd be happy to kind of have a conversation. Lynn, thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to wrap up this session at the moment, um, but it's not the end of the conversation, of course. I hope we manage to, you know, kick off today and get you thinking. We've got a great session coming on at 11.30, which is the energy transition and sustainability spotlight on shipping lines and, uh, and cargo owners. So that will lead on the story that uh, Lynn today has, um, has kicked off. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, you should all be uh, thinking now about how uh, to position your own terminals and ports, perhaps in the new uh, green carbon trade lanes, corridors, uh, and, and that's really uh, one of the takeaways for myself as well. So I think, uh, you know, on behalf of TOC organization, I'd like to thank uh, Lynn uh, for coming out here today and spending some time with us, and let's give her a big warm uh, appreciation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.